Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring alien consciousness. My guest is Dr. Paul Smith, who is the author of Reading the Enemy's Mind and the Essential Guide to Remote Viewing. He is the president of Remote Viewing Instructional Services and has been a guest on New Thinking Aloud many times in the past. Paul is based in Cedar City, Utah, home of the Shakespeare Festival. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Paul. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. Well, I'm glad to be here, Jeff. I, I wish I was really there, but you know what? Digital's better than nothing, isn't it? Well, I know all of our previous interviews have been in person, but I, yes, I guess this is our first Skype interview, and I'm uh, delighted to connect with you. We're going to be talking about alien consciousness, and I think a good starting point will be that you worked closely with Ingo Swan, who had a deep interest in this field. So let, let's start there. He believed that humans had a massive consciousness, ESP, whatever you want to call it, potential, but we had not realized it yet, and that the aliens actually were trying to engineer things so that we wouldn't realize that because they felt threatened by that. They they were worried that if we did ever realize it and discipline it and, and manage to, uh, well, to use, use it widely in our society, that it would put them at a disadvantage. And so, they have the high ground right now, but we could get it if we become uh, fully functional in a psychic way, if you will. And so, they're trying to engineer it so that we won't ever get that high ground. Um, so, they're very worried about it. He usually addressed it in terms of telepathy, uh, but for him at the time he was writing that, that was kind of a, a, a broader term for lots of psychic stuff, including remote viewing. Um, well, that's not even probably accurately said, but but whatever. He, he talked in terms of telepathy and aliens. Um, and in fact, he said that uh, even Earth governments were afraid of it and they were purposely trying to undermine attempts to develop it. Now, how much of this is just Ingo thinking too late at night? How much of it is real? I don't know, but it certainly seems plausible given the way that in particular extraterrestrial human encounters that have been reported, some of which quite quite uh, reliably reported, um, that the consciousness issue seems to be very much <laughs> on the minds of the aliens, shall we say. And, and Ingo, of course, had a lot of interesting ideas about a lot of things. And I, I probably should inject a disclaimer here. Uh, we did an interview a while back about remote viewing anomalies, which included UFOs, or as they're called, UAPs today. But uh, I actually have been dragged into this subject, uh, mostly kicking and screaming. I've been trying to resist it. So the fact is, I don't consider myself an expert on the UAP phenomenon or on uh, ETs, extraterrestrials in general. Of course, um, that's not necessarily, necessarily a liability in this field because there is so much baloney out there about all this stuff that I see no point in being an expert in that part of it. Um, I have um, actually an advantage in that I, as I said, kicking and screaming, and screaming uh, have been, that's happened because of my connections with people who are very much involved in the field from a responsible perspective, including Hal Putoff, Eric Davis, Jacques Vallée, John Alexander, uh, uh, and a, a few of the other folks uh, from, for example, uh, the Bigelow Corporation and stuff. And, and um, so, my exposure really has not been from the fantastic uh, imaginative side, but more from 
the nuts and bolts, what do we actually know, and what is actually reasonable to speculate uh, about these things. So again, not an expert, but what I am an expert in is remote viewing, and I'm somewhat of an expert in consciousness. So those tie in, I think, with what I've gotten from uh, from my friends and also from uh, my studies and my experiences in that perspective. Well, your background is in philosophy, and so when you talk about the nuts and bolts, I have a feeling you're not referring to the hardware, you're referring to the philosophical arguments relating to the nature of consciousness and self, and how we can apply those arguments to the whole question of alien consciousness. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Um, and of course, there are, there are people who are more expert in consciousness than me, and that may include you as well. I don't know. But I mean, in terms of being more expert than me. Um, but consciousness can be a little bit like ETs and UAPs in that there's a lot of fanciful things said about consciousness, which when you get right down to it, we really actually don't know if any of that's true. Uh, we each have our own basic experience of consciousness. So uh, I, I like to say, and, and I borrowed this from somebody else, um, and the one thing is nobody knows what consciousness is, right? But on the other hand, everybody knows what it is. And, and we're talking about subjective versus objective, right? So from the subjective perspective, we all know what consciousness is, even though we really don't have a way of defining it particularly. From an objective perspective, we can kind of feel around the edges of what it is. But when it gets right down to understanding it, causality, everything else, we're still way out there. We don't know. Well, you know, I think there's a, a paradox when it comes to the conventional approaches to consciousness, and it even goes back to William James and his writings on the stream of consciousness, in which he talks about consciousness is something that's private. I have my consciousness, it's accessible to me, it's not accessible to you. But then we have this little conundrum about remote viewing and about telepathy that seems to be a violation of that privacy. Well, it seems to be. Whether it is or not, we actually don't even know that. Uh, you can have the experience as if you may be accessing someone else's private mental contents. But when you get right down to it, everything we filter is through our perceptual systems. Uh, everything we perceive is filtered through our perceptual systems. And it inevitably becomes interpreted and, and becomes limited uh, through that experience. So, for example, people love to, love to say this about, um, about our normal sense perception in that our senses only perceive what they can perceive. And we have a limited frequency of vision. We have a li limited frequency of hearing. We have a limited uh, access to smells and tastes compared to maybe other species. And so the bottom line is we aren't perceiving the world as it really is, whatever as it really is actually means, right? Um, and, it's, and it's kind of an interpretive simulation, as they like to say. Now, some folks take that so far as to think that it's uh, this is the, the notion of idealism, where everything is created out of our minds. Uh, in an extreme solipsism, that is that everything is created out of one mind and everything else is a figment of, of that person's imagination, to speak very roughly. Um, of course, I like to think if that's the case, I'm the one that's generating the universe. And of course, Jeff, you think you're the one that's generating the universe, right? Uh, or maybe each of us are generating certain aspects of it. It, it. And the thing about it is because we are limited by our senses, we have no way to really know for sure. So the other side of that is that the simulation that our senses present to our perceptual centers and then are processed and present to our cognition, that, um, that those simulations are based on an external objective reality and that this is just a, a way our brains have of helping us interact with that external reality and maximize our chances for su survival and maximize the opportunities that we can take advantage of. So I tend to hold to that. I have a kind of a scientific realist view of the world as opposed to some of these other modalities which think that we all make this all up as we go along. Um, and, and I dare anyone to prove I'm wrong. You 
seem to be focusing pretty strictly here on sensory inputs. And, and you've raised the point, which is uh, being raised commonly now by a lot of people, that our sensorium, our experience of the world through the senses is a, a very rough picture of, of the world. Our sensory systems only let a limited amount of information in. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to remote viewing, I don't think we know what the limits are in, in that regard. Remote viewing may be less sensitive than our other senses, and yet in some ways less limited. Yes, and that's an interesting question. And, and it allows me to uh, actually respond to the, your earlier question. And I got distracted by my soliloquy off onto various theoretical issues. But um, the fact is, we it, when I when I talk about sensing, a, a lot of remote viewing is about perception. It really should have been called remote perception. But Ingo Swan was really taken with his visual experience in a remote viewing setting, and so uh, he called it remote viewing. But remote perception is a more accurate term because you can pick up uh, experiences from all the five senses plus a few more. Uh, it's a very kinesthetic experience, and, and kinesthetics is a sort of a sense modality, and you can detect information using it, okay? And so it, it's a very broad-spectrum kind of uh, experience that remote viewing is. Here's the problem. Uh, in remote viewing, you are, of course, still very dependent on sense perception, even though your senses aren't involved, in some way it seems that uh, that our perceptual centers in our brain are activated so that we perceive what's at the other end of the remote viewing session. We perceive that target in sensory terms. Now, there's one further mode, which is I call it various things, but right now I'm just going to call it a just knowing. You just know stuff from the target, and it isn't sensory modulated, if you want to use that term. Uh, there's actually probably a better term. It's not coming to my head right now. Um, it's not, it's not uh, modulated by the senses. It's just a sort of an intuitive knowing uh, things about your target. Uh, but even that, if you think about it, is being processed by your cognitive hard and software in your brain. And so the filters still exist between you and your remote viewing target. So we do still have some of those limiting features. Now, are they enough limiting to keep us from being any more incisive, perceptive, whatever you want to say, in terms of, of our experience and understanding of the target we're at? And, the, and that answer is somewhat out, but I tend to think that remote viewing has a broader uh, aspect, a bigger dimension, if you will, in terms of obtaining information about the target that you couldn't obtain were you personally there, were you physically there, were you relying strictly on your physical abilities. Which means when we have the experience of accessing someone else's mental contents, I'm not going to call it telepathy, but guys, I think it's a, a, a bigger thing or... Yeah, telepathy is a different topic we can get into, but but I'm not going to call it exactly telepathy, but it has many of the, the hallmarks of telepathic experience. Um, I tend to think that maybe we are in some ways able to access subject matter and experiences that we wouldn't normally have were we physically and personally there. Your mentor... Ingo Swan, who taught you remote viewing, has reported on a number of occasions having encounters with alien beings using remote viewing. Yes, and frankly, I have too. <laughs> now, whether those are real, I, you know, I still kind of feel like the jury's out. But given uh, various things that have happened and I've learned since then, I'm willing to give them a little more credence. Still, no given remote viewing experience can be counted as veridical until you actually have confirmation. Uh, and I haven't got confirmation from these things. But you also tend to judge the, the validity of something based on the preponderance of evidence. And I have some evidence that doesn't come from me that maybe I was on to something in, in, the, in those experiences. 
and um, Ingo and whoever else may have reported these kinds of things as well. Now, of course, a caution here that in the remote viewing community and really in the general psychic community, whatever you call it, new age community, uh, there was a tendency to take a fact and turn it into a million fantasies. And so you'll often hear this. You'll hear people repeat the same stories about Joe McMoneagle or Ingo Swan or even sometimes Paul Smith uh, reporting having had some kind of connection or or interaction mentally with some uh, alien entity, right? Um, and they'll take that and they'll turn it into a massive topic of discussion and people weigh in who actually are, are fantasizing and claiming they've had actual experiences. Uh, and, and as you go, the stories get wilder and wilder and wilder. And it's like each person's trying to top the next one and coming up with a more fantastic story. So you have to be careful. Now, just because there is fantasy, not just in this, in this domain, but in, uh, in other things as well, just because there is fantasy doesn't mean there isn't a real there there. There may be a core, and in this case, I'm beginning to suspect there is a core of actual legitimate uh, experience there that is unfortunately getting kind of smothered by all the fantasy that is generated about it. Well, I will agree with you that uh, the UFO, or I'll call it the ufology community, is in many ways like a circus. There, there's, there's all sorts of entertainers out there do, doing fancy tricks and talking of, about hybrid children and uh, journeys aboard uh, vehicles across to the other end of the galaxy and visits to other planets and lengthy conversations with 30 or 40 uh, different types of alien beings. Uh, so there's good reason to be skeptical, and I understand uh, that that's the position that you're coming from. Now, on the other hand, I happen to be the author of a book myself called The PK Man. I don't know if you, you've even read it. Oh, yes. I have an autographed copy, and I read it very, well, it's been a long time, but very carefully, so... So I'm under the impression that if you want evidence that somebody has had telepathic interactions with alien beings associated with UFOs, one could make a very strong case based on uh, the material that I gathered in a 10-year field study project as reported in that book. So I, I'm inclined to think that uh, this is definitely a topic worth exploring. Well, I agree. Um, and, and of course, I, I'm not alleging this about what you've heard in your book, but of course, you also have to be careful in that uh, people can actually be absolutely convinced that they've, they've had that experience. Uh, but of course, they didn't. And, and with a PK man, I think there's some speculation with that, whether, whether it was PK or whether it was actually alien experience, right? And so PK psychokinesis, right? And uh, you have a much better uh, understanding of that than me. And like I said, it's been a long time, so I couldn't defend that. Uh, that uh, I'm not going to call it a claim, that hypothesis at all in this case. But but it's something to be concerned about. Um, but I think there's actually even more reason to be concerned about this, and that is uh, actually addressed in a paper that Jacques Vallée and Eric Davis wrote a while back. The and of course I should have looked this up. Uh, it's got incommensurability in the title. And it's kind of six models of uh, of what's happening in UFO, UAP, human extra, extraterrestrial uh, interaction, right? And one part of that is uh, the mental or consciousness and effect that that there are clearly consciousness based effects that aliens. Assume I'm mean, going to use that term. There's a lot of debate about what they really are exactly, but I'm going to call them aliens. Uh, about aliens being able to impose consciousness effects on humans. And there's some pretty good evidence for that now. I mean, it's still not evidence enough to convince the, convince the skeptics. And, and of course, it's um, it could ultimately be explained by other things. But uh, right now, it, it seems fairly thought-provoking that there's something going on and it involves aliens then projecting their their desired experience on humans. Uh, it's possible, and I know there are uh, 
There are, of course, experiencers out there who will be pushed back against this, but it's possible that most or potentially all abduction experiences are these manufactured consciousness things that um, the aliens want people to experience even if nothing actually happens. Now, I'm not willing to reject all experiences as not as being consciousness artifacts. Um, there, there is likely, I mean, there's some evidence to indicate there's some real stuff going on too. So what is it? And it could be both. Could, both things are going on. So what that means is all abduction experiences are actually real. Okay? But some of them are physically real and some of them are mentally real injected into the experiencer by an alien. Right? So what's, what's true here? I don't know. Uh, the people who've had these experiences are absolutely sure they've had them. They're absolutely adamant they've had them. Uh, and maybe they did. Uh, the problem, of course, with our minds and brains and consciousness is that with the right inputs, we can believe just about anything. I mean, you'll find people who have hallucinations that are clearly generated by some, some brain artifact, and they're absolutely convinced that they're real. Um, so it's not impossible that that accounts for a lot of this. I don't know. I'm just, just proposing a potential way of looking at it. What that does imply, though, is that there really are aliens, no matter what you, what you, what the source of your experience may be. Ingo Swan was very concerned that uh, aliens may be manipulating the whole human population in, di in different ways. That they seem to exhibit the uh, ability to control human consciousness. Sometimes people report being paralyzed. Uh, people report all sorts of visionary journeys. And as you say, we don't know for sure whether uh, they really happened or whether the memory of it was somehow implanted in them. And as a practitioner myself of hypnosis, I know that it's possible to induce hip hallucinations in, in a good hypnotic subject. I've done it myself. Yes, and in fact, you could say uh, that humans are doing it uh, in general. I mean, uh, uh, that explains most politicians, doesn't it? <laughs> Manipulating people's consciousness, although we use, they use much more rudimentary tools than, than aliens presumably do. Well, a lot of uh, political manipulation is based on... Uh, Generate, stimulating the amygdala of the brain. In other words, generating fear and anger in, in people. And there seems to be a fair amount of that associated with uh, aliens and UFOs as well. And that's true. Um, I do want to add something here. People tend to associate the amygdala with fear and flight or fight or flight responses and stuff. It actually governs a broad range of emotions, not just fear. And so, any manipulation probably, whether it's for in a positive way or a negative way, probably in some way interacts with the amygdala, right? But fear is a very powerful part of that. And the reason, of course, is, you know, explainable by evolution. Uh, you, you, well, you, you can either explain it by evolution or you explain it by God. Either way, it's been implanted in us um, because fear is a very powerful survival enhancer. Right. Um, it's often better be afraid of something and find out later it's okay than it is to be okay with something and find out you really should have feared it. Right. So um, it would make sense that both in politics and alien human encounters, that if the, how should we call it, perpetrator, I don't know, there might be a better term, I'll say perpetrator of the, of the manipulation wants to have a very quick and very effective response, fear is the go-to avenue. Uh, if you make someone afraid of something, um, then you will get their attention a whole lot quicker. And you and if you manipulate it properly, you can get them to do what you want them to do much more efficiently and easily. Now, earlier you mentioned that uh, in your remote viewing experiences, you had an experience which you are willing to interpret at, at least tentatively as some sort of communication or encounter with an alien consciousness. Could you describe it? Sure. But let me first give you a little bit of a preamble here. Um, I've often 
experienced uh, emotional mental contents of subjects at the target site, whether they were just incidentally there or they were the actual uh, intended uh, person for me to access. Um, one particular case, a good example is uh, I was targeted on a bio weapons accident in a in a Soviet lab. Um, of course, I'm blind to this target. You know, you're always remote. You should always be blind to the target. I had no idea what it was. I get in on this and I identify kind of an underground facility and there's something that has been released into the air that is very harmful. And I pick up on this guy who I'm feeling his emotions. He's essentially in the process of choking to death from whatever this is. That was quite disturbing, as you can imagine, for him especially, but somewhat for me as well. Um, but that was direct access to... Uh, to what was uh, what was going on with him, and I've had plenty of other similar kinds of experiences. In fact, there's a whole gap category in what we call stage four controlled remote viewing, um, where uh, there's a there's a, a a column we label it EI that stands for emotional impact, and you pick up on the emotions and other subjective experiences of people at the target. So, again, that has to be accessing their mental contents. There's no way you could do that just for outside observation. Well, in some cases, maybe you could, but in general, you wouldn't be able to do it very uh, accurately. So, um, the one alien encounter that I recall, uh, Ingo had a project where he's remote viewing a certain anomaly on the far side of the moon. Now, the anomaly existed. It was showed up in satellite photo. Well, not, whatever it was that went around the moon or took pictures, right? Like maybe they were satellites. I don't know. Uh, so the anomaly existed, but no one knew what it was. And someone got curious and, and, uh, asked him to put together a project to remote view the anomaly. So he asked me to participate. He didn't tell me it was the moon. There's another guy uh, involved. And, um, he just gave me some coordinates and I start remote viewing this thing. And I, right off, I realized I wasn't breathing very well. <laughs> it was kind of, there's no air here, you know, that's kind of thing. So fairly quickly, I figured out I was on the moon. Um, very barren landscape, very sharp edged uh, geographical features, all everything you can, you'd understand about the moon if you were there. Um, and in the process, it got more and more involved. And I just, discovered in my session, um, and, and actually I did two or three on this particular target, um, an underground chamber that was part artificial and part natural. There were activities in this chamber, and then I perceived this, I don't know exactly what to call it. I mean, it, it was, I guess it was a ship of sorts. Uh, this, uh, And I have a sketch of it. I don't know if we can edit that in or not, but... Uh, uh, but I had this perception of the vessel. It was a little bit like a manta ray uh, in shape. And it's coming out of this mm, cavern, I guess, or underground passage or whatever. Uh, and I perceived and, and realized this was long before the new version of Battlestar Galactica came out. Um, I perceived that this was both biological and artif artificial. It was a kind of a... And an amalgam of of a life form and technology, uh, which in itself was kind of surprising to me. I had never entertained anything like that before, and yet I'm getting these perceptions. And it also had a sort of consciousness associated with it, and a cognitive one at that. And as I'm perceiving this vehicle, um, I suddenly realized it was perceiving me. I recognized that I was interfacing with it in some way. And it was not particularly happy about that, but it was like it, it, there was nothing it could do about it. So it was essentially said, oh, well, it continued on, right? But, but that was the first time I ever had that kind of thing where I felt like I had been recognized as the target. You get a few rare cases where other people say that. Now, uh, in various settings, Joe McMonigle has one instance where he said that he was at a target and was recognized by another remote viewer that was at a target was of a of another uh, another nationality. Um, but the interesting thing here is that if I'm recalling this correctly, Ingo himself in his session had a similar experience. Um, I finally I later got access to some of this material. He gave me the final report and stuff. Excuse me, and some of the raw data. 
Um, so for, for one thing, that's some confirmation that maybe what I was experiencing had some truth to it. Um, I still don't necessarily guarantee that because uh, it could be, there's this thing called tele telepathic overlay remote viewing where you do pick up on another viewer's uh, uh, impressions as well. And then you report them thinking they're your own. Uh, I'm generally pretty good at not doing that these days. That's kind of a beginner problem. Uh, and so I tend to discount that that was going on, but I can't rule it out. Yeah. So <laughs> that's my, uh, my main experience with this. Ingo reported also going to the moon. And if I remember correctly, uh, encountering people who I, I'm calling them people, uh, I think, uh, they were, were aliens, uh, who who didn't want him there, who essentially you know, kicked him out of uh, whatever location he was in. They they had that ability to just boot him right out of there uh, while he was remote viewing them. Yes. In fact, I'm glad you reminded me of that. <laughs> um, so Ingo had a good friend named Bob Durant. He originally met Bob uh, when Bob and author Jim Schnabel decided they wanted to be trained in controlled remote viewing and managed to talk Ingo into doing that. This was long after he'd, he'd retired, so to speak, from the military program. And he hadn't done, you know, he hadn't trained anybody in the meantime. So, uh, so uh, he trained both of them. Bob became his friend and they interacted a lot over time. So for possibly even this project, he had Bob working as his monitor. And in the course of uh, in the course of that session, Ingo tries to get in on this, and he said something along the lines. I'd, I'd have to go back and, and reread uh, the transcript that I made of the tape, but uh, something along the lines of, "Well, they know I'm here, and they don't want me here, and they're telling me to leave." And it's kind of like the internet connection broke, right? <laughs> so that was that was pretty a a, a pretty interesting outcome uh, and and you reminded me of that now so as you point out we don't have independent confirmation it would be very hard to obtain ind independent confirmation of a remote viewing taking place uh, supposedly on the moon supposedly interacting with aliens but now uh, this is the sort of thing that you're reporting and Ingo is reporting. And I, I would venture to say amongst the remote viewing community, maybe as many as 50% of remote viewers have uh, been curious enough to have had this sort of experience. I don't know if that many. Um, I'd say I'd say the the percentage is much smaller than that. And of course, you have to recall that there are remote viewers of all levels of experience, from just beginners, all the way up to having done many, many, many sessions. So, uh, I would incline incline to think if a view if a beginner reported it, they would probably be misleading themselves. Uh, if a very experienced person reported, that would kind of depend on what their their history with remote viewing is there are some people who've been doing it for years, but all they do is anomaly targets. And those guys, you know, their stuff I wouldn't trust as being necessarily accurate. So, uh, but certainly there have been a, a number of folks who reported that uh, beyond just the original remote viewers. Um, you know, and that's, of course, you're right about the problem is how do you know? You know, you, you get the subjective first hand report and that's it. That's all. That's all the evidence you've got, really. Well, uh, one of the remote viewers who's reported on it extensively is Angela Thompson Smith, who was uh, at least briefly related to you uh, through marriage. No, no, wait. Let's be clear. I didn't marry her. <laughs> as my brother, even though Angela's a fine woman, and I wouldn't have been minded being married to her, perhaps you know. Uh, that's how we were related, right? But she was one of the founders of the Remote Viewing Association and uh, has a good track record. I know she's been involved in law enforcement cases that have been successfully resolved uh, with some of her inputs. So uh, she, her book, Voices from the Cosmos, uh, reports on her 
she, I think she describes it as telepathic communication with numerous aliens. So, so there's, there is that. There is. And, and again, th these are all bits of evidence, but they're not conclusive because they're essentially anecdotal. You, you'll get, you'll get skeptics in, in the science community and elsewhere who will say, well, that's anecdotal evidence as if it was no evidence at all. That's not true. Anecdotal evidence is evidence. It's just maybe not as strong as other evidence that you might develop. So you get a whole bunch of points of personal testimony about this. Um, you have to have to understand there is something going on. Now, if it is, it's either, it could be mass delusion as possible. Um, it could be, uh, that they're all correct, which is, I think, even less likely. Um, but there's also the possibility that there'll be a, at least a few real examples, real experiences. And then, of course, lots of other people who are interested or fans or admire or whatever and want to have those experiences themselves then generate some on their own, uh, some of which may be real and some of which aren't. You know, it's impossible to know. Well, if one was to try and get inside of the mind of an alien uh, to find out what what is it like to be an alien, like what is it like to be a bat, uh, I, I know it's a hard thing to do. Uh, you and I, I know, have both been married for a long time, and I still uh, wonder what is it like to be my wife. In which case, you'd have real experience about what it's like to be an, to to be an alien, right? <laughs> I think I think males and females in our culture are uh, probably every culture are somewhat alien to each other, no matter what, right? So if you could have that experience, that would be novel. Of course, this is the essentially the other minds problem that has been a perennial issue in philosophy. Where uh, how do we know that other people have a mind? And in everyday experience, when you really start weighing what it means to know and whether you know that someone else has a mind, we really don't know, right? We base it strictly on behavioral cues. A person acts like they have a mind. They act like we do, and we know we have a mind. Therefore, we conclude that they have a mind as well, and we don't ever question it unless you get into a debate in philosophy. Um, but in fact, we talked about getting in the minds of aliens. If you could get into the mind of another person really thoroughly in the way you are able to get into yours, um, it would be in a way an alien experience as well because they, their experiences, their understandings, their knowledge, their motivations, while there's a general similarity across the human race, um, each one of us realizes those things in a different way. So it's kind of like this is this is alien, you know. You get into somebody's brain and or mind. I'm saying uh, I want to distinguish that, uh, and it's an alien experience in in many ways. At least it's one though you can understand, which may not be the case with aliens. Right? Um, we have the assumption assumption here on Earth when we're dealing with other humans that they are more or less like us, despite what I just said. At least we can understand them. We mostly, mostly. Um, but we have no idea whether alien minds, brains to begin with, or minds are constructed at all in the same way that we ours are. It could well be that we get into some alien's mind and we cannot make heads nor tails of what's going on in there. Um, it's even possible we get into someone's alien's mind and we actually are driven crazy by that. Uh, there's a science fiction story I read years ago where something like that happened. The alien was, the alien experience was so foreign that the person, uh, I think it was a male, so himself, came away just totally messed up. <laughs> right? So, so we don't know. Now, it's also possible aliens generally experience the universe the same way you, we do. The, the mechanisms are similar. Um, and despite a lot of things that don't necessarily make sense to us because we don't have the, the context, the cognitive context, in general, we can understand the experiences they may have, the, at least the basic sensory experiences. Uh, and of course, we don't know that until we actually try it. And we don't even know if we can try it. That's always, that's always the question. 
Well, a lot of humans have uh, animals, have dogs, for example. Dogs are very much like us. They're vertebrates, they're mammals, but they have a sense of smell a million times more powerful than that of a human. And uh, also, I believe they're colorblind. Uh, so, uh, you know, we can at least imagine what that might be like. Uh, you reported in your remote viewing experience the alien was a vehicle, I think, and, and it was partially biological and partially electronic or mechanical in some way. It was a fusion of bi a biological and a synthetic being. Did you have a sense at all of what it was like to be that being? I think you did. You, you described it as uh, noticing that you were there. So there were some very rudimentary understandings there. I understood that it was both biological and, 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 and artificial. Um, but more I was picking up was the intentionality there, right? And, and intentionality is probably a worthy topic here because consciousness and intentionality are inseparably connected, um, at least at the higher levels. Um, and so, you know, I couldn't tell you what it was like to be in there, but it clearly... It understood it was being, how do I say this, interacted with, I guess. It understood it was being interacted with, and it understood how to express to me that it, its displeasure at being interacted with, or its annoyance is probably a better term. Uh, or, <laughs> there's another way to look at that. So, I mean, well, yeah, this is this is typical of this 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 subject matter, even if it doesn't include aliens. Uh, or it wasn't expressing its displeasure to me. I was just recognizing the displeasure as the displeasure or annoyance that it was experiencing. I'm almost inclined to think that latter was really what was going on, uh, which in this case means that there was enough similarity between that and me that I was able at least to recognize in large terms what was going on. Well, you described, the, you used the word interacted. You were interacting with it, obviously not at the physical level because you weren't physically there. You were interacting with it at a mental level and you sensed that it responded uh, to that interaction, that it recognized that you were there mentally. Yes, and of course this word interaction is really loaded. It can mean everything from being in a wrestling match with it to just my perceiving it, it experienced the perception and then I experienced its reaction. And, and there's a whole wide spectrum of what counts as interaction. Unfortunately, people when they talk about interacting psychically or whatever, they tend to like to get carried away with what that means. They tend to go towards the full-on making things happen physically kinds of interaction. And I know you have some views on that, that uh, that, that can be done. Essentially, it's, it's psychokinesis, but in a uh, mentally influencing kind of way with a subject, right? And, uh, and there's, there's, clearly some really good research that shows that that can happen at a micro level. Okay? Uh, there's much anecdotal evidence that that can happen uh, at a macro level, but I would say that's not been demonstrated in, in the lab, although maybe you have a different opinion about that. It depends on what you mean by uh, by the lab. I'll just give you a quick anecdote from uh, the PK man, uh, Ted Owens, had a reputation for having the ability to produce UFOs on demand that would then be uh, seen visibly and reported on. And he did that for me. He uh, said he would produce a UFO. And then he called me up uh, on the phone. And it was uh, in December of 1976. And he was very excited. He said he could feel it coming. He said, this is going to be a huge sighting. He said, it's going to be seen by hundreds of people. 
It's going to be photographed, and the photograph of this UFO will be published on the front page of one of your local newspapers, which is exactly what happened a few days later. In fact, not only was it photographed, it was videotaped, and the videotape was broadcast on uh, Channel 9 television in San Francisco. So uh, here we have, I, I guess be, with the photographs and videotapes, physical evidence that something happened, something associated with what we call UFOs, uh, something that this man who said he's in touch with, uh, he called them the space intelligences, hyperspace beings who resided in an invisible UFO hovering over the earth, uh, let him know that uh, it somehow in conjunction with him, they were going to produce. And, and then it actually happened in a physically demonstrable way. Well, I mean, there's three things going on, that he actually summoned aliens, uh, or that it was psychokinesis, he created that himself, or whether there's precognition. Those are all three possibilities, but uh, in, in any case, they seem to be intertwined, whichever way you look at it, with an alien consciousness. It's even possible, I suppose, that assuming aliens really were involved in that, that they're the ones that that actually induced him to make that prediction and to get a hold of you and everything else. So that would be aliens projecting their conscious desires on on a human. So, yeah, I mean, the interesting, well, there's lots of interesting things about this, but one very interesting thing is how even having a verifiable outcome still leaves us with tons of ambiguities and uncertainties about what actually happened. Well, if we take Ted Owens, the man I'm talking about, who incidentally died in 1987, at his word, he, uh, he was an experiment on their part. That uh, he, he said, I'm like the canary in the coal mine, so to speak. That he was uh, given these powers, and there are many examples of, in the literature in which people who have had a UFO encounter of one kind or another end up having uh, magnified psychic abilities, and he, he said they gave him unusual abilities in his thinking. Nobody since Moses has had these kinds of powers, and the purpose was for them, I guess you could call it a sociological experiment to see how the human population would respond to someone with those abilities. So it suggests uh, the possibility that we are uh, being experimented on by these beings. So, so interestingly, he wasn't the guinea pig. He was the laboratory equipment, and we were the guinea pigs. Yeah. <laughs> right. They're trying to gauge the human population as to how open it is to... Uh, uh, seeing in a straightforward, matter-of-fact manner the uh, abilities of someone who has pronounced psychic abilities, whether it's precognitive or psychokinetic, uh, we will debate. It does bring to mind one of Ingo's concerns, uh, his, his worry about the ability of aliens to interject their consciousness into human behavior. Well, I think it'd be fair to say that my experience with Ted Owens would be not inconsistent with Ingo's hypothesis. Exactly what I was thinking, because if they were experimenting using Ted, they may well try to uh, try be trying to assess just how likely we are to be to start exploring this in a larger scale, more rigorous way than we have up to this point. Yeah, here you have a man who did have, from my uh, evaluation, pronounced abilities. I have on in my files today, from the time I spent with him prior to his death, 160-some demonstrations that uh, he produced that were, I would say, the, the odds that any one of them would be successful is less than 1%, but roughly two-thirds of them worked out the way he claimed they would.
And we're talking large scale events, hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, volcanoes, power blackouts, heat waves, cold waves in the middle of summer, uh, heat waves in the middle of winter, thing, things of that sort. I sure wish he was still around because I would try and get him to bring us some snow here in Utah. And of course, there are shamans all around the world in other cultures who seem to be able to do this, at least within their local communities, on a routine basis. It'd be interesting to import some of those. Maybe we can get them a green card. Yeah. yeah. Well, would they have to become Mormons to uh, operate in Utah? No, they don't. No, not anymore. Those were the old days. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, it seems as if Ingo might have been onto something with with his concern that aliens are interfering with uh, on a global scale with the human population. But I think of it this way: uh, the great mystics have said all along, our consciousness is one with everything. We participate in one mind, according to Larry Dossey, for example, who wrote a book by that title. Uh, so it would suggest that we have access uh, by going deep within ourselves to not only uh, aliens, but animals and, and probably a wide range of other beings. You know, the mystics would talk about angels and demons and demigods and jinns and, you know, a whole zoology of supersensual or super yeah, super sensual beings. So they may all be influencing us in, in different ways. Aliens, just one subpopulation. <laughs> yeah, maybe a big one. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I have actually a different, different opinion on this one mind thesis, but I, you know, I don't want to get into that right now. Uh, that could be a whole other talk. Um, but we don't have to be of one mind to be influenced across. I, I kind of hold a, okay, what do I call it? A pluralistic view of the universe in which there are a bunch of self-existent entities with their own uh, consciousness attributes. And uh, all we need to be, and I don't want people to think I'm speaking in terms of frequencies because it's not frequencies, but... Um, but if we're on the right frequency, we, we could, in theory, interact with another consciousness. Uh, just kind of like if you're on the same radio frequency, you can, uh, you can communicate with another radio station. Uh, I'll, I'll, some other time we can explain why I think frequency is wrong terminology here. But, but anyway, uh, what's interesting here today, um, is that you have a bunch of ideas about aliens that I think play into the consciousness thing. Uh, some people are absolutely sure that all aliens are benign, that they're all friendly, that they're, they, all they want to do is help. And so these folks want to call them down. They want to invite them to come visit and, and come and share their wisdom with us, right? And, and of course, I always say, what makes them think the aliens even care to respond to your invitation? <laughs> Maybe they're waiting for one from, from, you know, the UN or something rather than just your individual invitation. But, but that's sort of a, maybe an unfortunate mocking thing to say. Um, but, uh, but, it, but it misses some, some important points here. There's an assumption that being more advanced technologically means that you're more advanced morally and that you're more advanced in terms of, uh, you know, um, treating people better and that kind of thing. And I don't think that, I, I actually call that a logical fallacy because there is no necessary linkage between technology and technological advancement and moral or ethical advancement. Now, there's some reason to, to hope that that's the case, uh, but there's no guarantee it's true. And I, I see a bunch of models here, five different models. I don't know if you want me to go into those. Is this a good place to talk about that? or now We're talking about whether they're friendly or not. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and that, of course, goes to intentionality, which is, of course, as I said, very tightly connected to consciousness. Intentionality is essentially the attitude with which you 
ex, you as express your consciousness. I mean, that's one way of talking about it. Attitudes, motivations with which you engage your consciousness. And so, yeah, one, one possibility is that, that aliens are friendly. And I call that the ET model, ET, the terrestrial model based on the, on the movie. The other extreme, of course, is that aliens technologically advanced that they are, they're still, they're still absolutely I won't say evil because evil is not the right term here, but they're absolutely malevolent, and uh, and they do mean the worst for for us, maybe any other race they encounter. I call that the Independence Day model, right? Um, and then there is the uh, the set the possibility that uh, that there are both, uh, in fact, a wide spectrum spectrum of aliens out there. Some of whom are benevolent, some of whom are malevolent some of whom are just sort of in between, some who don't care, you know, and, and kind of like the way things are on Earth today even, right? And I call that the Star Trek or the uh, Star Wars model because in those movies, of course, you have a variety, right, of, of aliens of, of all persuasions. Um, and uh, I'll just mention one more. Uh, no, there are two more. One is the self-interest model, which is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy model, where where uh, the aliens, they're perfectly fu- happy to leave us alone uh, unless we have something they want. Uh, it's like in the Hitchhiker's Guide, the Vogons destroyed the Earth, not because they had anything against the Earth, but because they needed a place for a hyperspatial bypass, you know, kind of like imminent domain taking out your house because then you put in a, a freeway interchange, right? Uh, but the one that's probably... If, Maybe the most concern, uh, concerning of all, maybe even the most likely, I don't know, is the incomp- in, in the incommensurability model, uh, to borrow that term from, from Eric Davis and Jacques Vallée. Incommensurability essentially means that you, you have no point of understanding, no point of communications. Uh, it's like you don't even recognize each other, right? And so this model... The aliens don't even see us as anything but maybe mold on the surface of this planet. And I call this the stepping on ants uh, model where, you know, you're walking down the sidewalk and you step on an ant or two. You don't even notice it. The ant does, of course, but you don't notice it. Uh, And aliens could well be so different from us that they have no concept that we're even an intelligent species or even a species at all. Uh, I, I presume they might recognize us as a species. But they're so different that they don't even think about it. And so we could end up <laughs> being toast because um, they plug in the toaster and don't realize we're in there, you know. <laughs> so so we have those five models. And uh, I think the evidence is, for me, it seems more likely that it's the Star Wars, Star Trek model, where there are a lot of different species out there, which would account, account for at least some uh, reason that aliens would be trying to interact with us consciously, even if it's a mani- in a manipulative way. Uh, if they were evil, like an Independence Day, they wouldn't even bother. They just, you know, wipe wipe everybody out and move on. Um, if they're friendly and, and universally benign, that would also account for that. So, you know, I tend to think that that the the that the other the aliens, the other species, intelligent species that exist in in the universe. Um, at least some of them are friendly, but we can't count on them all being friendly. Uh, so it's it's best to, here's where fear kicks in. It's best to be careful uh, until they show us that they are benign rather than just jumping whole hog into embracing them and finding out that they have a dagger hidden in their cloak. Well, I can attest from my own interactions with people who claim to be contactees. Uh, in, in the case of Ted Owens, there were many harmful uh, experiences that occurred. Typically, he'd come into a community and say, I'm here to uh, save you. I am Earth's ambassador from the space intelligences, and I know you have a drought in Utah or wherever, and, and I can end it. And People would say to him, well, you're a kook, you're crazy, get out of here. And then he would say, I guess I better teach you a lesson. And <laughs> and those lessons could be, uh, I don't know if I would even call them malevolent, but they could be harmful to people. 
you know, maybe people needed to be taught a lesson, uh, but they were not friendly lessons. Uh, on the other hand, I've talked to people who claim that they've been aboard uh, UFO craft and have actually visited other planets and had lengthy encounters with aliens who, in, at least in their personal experience, they, they say uh, these beings are totally positive and friendly and helpful. Uh, so there's every reason to think that there's a, if, in my experience, every reason to think you're correct that there's a spectrum out there. Well, it's, it's kind of a blind man and the elephant uh, story, isn't it? So if the ones who are going to pick you up and take you on a tour of, the, of, a, of another planet are more likely to be the benign ones. Uh, the ones who are going to teach you a lesson, although I think that might have been Ted himself, right? But, uh, but certainly people have been harmed by UFOs, uh, UFO encounters and such. So, so you know, those are the ones, and those people probably feel like they're evil, right? So, and the fact is, it just has to do with who you've associated, which ones you've associated with, and what the outcome of that association was. Uh, and then you draw a conclusion. I think we have to sum up what evidence we have. And, and I want to, again, emphasize, we don't have any, we don't have really good evidence for all of this. It's, it's, it's a very big issue, very big subject to research. And we've just barely started putting together. Um, I, I think one great thing about the U.S. government finally acknowledging its fault and at least to some degree maintaining a research program of this is um, as long as it's left to the popular domain where people speculate, speculate about reptilians and, and uh, archers and alphas and tari and all that stuff, we're not going to make any real headway uh, that the government's and it's not just the U.S. now that are kind of following this. The, the governments are actually doing uh, as rigorous as possible, rigorous research into this, um, I think is extremely important because that's the only way we're going to actually gain real understanding of this. And it may take decades, centuries, who knows, or it may happen tomorrow. But, but I think that's important and necessary and I hope the government keeps still doing it. As a matter of fact, I recently interviewed a fellow, uh, Charles Upton, who is uh, very skeptical about the intentions of uh, aliens. And he was in touch with someone I think you know, Kit Green, uh, who worked on the remote viewing project from within the CIA, as I recall. And according to Charles Upton, Kit Green is now involved in looking at uh, people who have had encounters with UFOs and, and just to measure the health consequences. And uh, uh, he's concerned that uh, those encounters leave people with many health problems. You know, there's a book out by some, by some at least you know, two folks I know, George Knapp and, uh, and Colm Kelleher and then another guy, uh, called Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, and uh, they document some of that stuff. Uh, also, Hal Putoff gave a really good talk a while back for the for a, a joint conference between the Society for Scientific Exploration and the International Remote Viewing Association, in which he at least mentioned a number of the, of the uh, effects and uh, evidences that they've been able to accumulate over time. Um, very, very interesting, very revelatory, shall we say. Uh, and there's certainly still way more out there to reveal. We've interviewed Colin Kelleher about uh, the Skinwalker Ranch on this channel. I would encourage, well, there are many interviews on the New Thinking Aloud channel covering this and related topics. So I would encourage interested viewers to go to our listings page if, if they want to pursue that further. And uh, Paul, thank you so much for being with me today. You're absolutely welcome, Jeff. Uh, this is always a pleasure to have these conversations. Uh, you're one of the most rational, irrational people out there. <laughs> Well, it's a pleasure to talk to you anytime. I uh, hope we have many more conversations. I agree. I, 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 I plan on it. <laughs> and for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us.